Uh, all right, thanks. Uh, well, for those who don't know me, I'm uh, Jan Brenny. I work for Palantir for some time. And uh, now I'm going to talk about uh, lock-in and synchronization. And to be honest, um, I am a bit nervous because this is for me like a skating on a very, very thin ice, right? Because when it comes to locking and synchronizing thread and, and things like that, it's so very easy to trip. I mean, if you trip, it's not usually very nice and something goes really wrong, right? Uh, and the other thing is that, you know, there are quite a few people doing the virtual machines long before I was even born, right? So I'm not really sure if there is something I can tell you, but here I am, let me try. Uh, okay, a uh, little, about, little bit about the motivation, why I even get involved into this lock-in business, uh, which I don't really like, but I somehow, somehow had to do something with it. Uh, you may know that uh, I have, or we have an implementation of a small talk that can run Java and the small talk at the same time um, in a way that the VM doesn't really know whether it runs Java or, or small talk, right? Uh, but well, Java was designed slightly differently, or the, the design goals were slightly different. And uh, they say, we want to make a system which is really ready for massively multi-threaded environment. Uh, so they introduced these synchronized blocks to solve these problems and make the system really thread safe. So there is a lot of synchronization, a lot more than in small talk. A lot, lot more. Just to, just to give you an idea, right? Uh, those are few benchmarks. Let's start with the, with the first one, the JVM boot. This is just to make the the basic classes of the Java being able to actually start executing the public static void main sort of thing, right? So that's a very, very small code. Yet, execution of this code uh, yields to, you know, 6,000 or 7,000 synchronized, you know, lock and unlock operations on the monitors. 7,000, and it does nothing. Uh, funny enough, only in 72 cases, well, back then when I measured it, only in 72 cases there were actual contentions, so there were actually two threads competing to get into the same critical section. So all the rest, all the 6,000 lock-in and unlock-in operations were done all for nothing. They were, they were essentially needed, right? Uh, which is... 1% or something, whatever. Uh, then a slightly more complex example, just a groovy, you know, just, just imagine that you open a workspace and evaluate the 3 plus 4, right? Well, 100,000. <laughs> Bloody hell, 100,000 lock operations, right? But yet again, 95% of those lock and unlock operations were not needed. There were no, comp you know, no threads were competing. Yet, they had to be done. Uh, and then, you know, starting to Apache uh, Tomcat servlet container. Well, 700,000. But uh, again, the percentage of how many times there were essentially contentions so there, that you ex essentially need to lock is pretty much the same. You know, it's, it's a very small percentage. So, the key here is that you need to lock because you need to guard yourself. That was one of the design decisions behind Java. You need, you need to make a library thread safe, so you need to lock. But because you lock a lot, you have to lock bloody fast. Right? Uh, and you know, back then I had the problem and I solved the problem, uh, I will show you in a minute, uh, and it immediately yielded by 30% more performance. That was, I, mean, I, I was really amazed. Uh, maybe it was because the previous implementation was so bad, but anyway. 
Uh, and you know, I deal with that years, years ago. Uh, but since then, I was thinking like, I mean, is the solution we did for Java, uh, is, it, you know, is there any benefit for small talk as well? And uh, I wasn't sure, but I kept thinking about it and talking to people. And uh, people are saying, and we had the same conversation, conversation yesterday with some other people here. And they say, OK, well, we don't have native threads in small talk. So we don't need to lock that much. And, and the lock -in, lock, performance of lock-in is not important and, uh, and things like that. Uh, well, I thought about it. And um, let's just see this very simple method which closes a file, right? Uh, this is copy-paste from widely used, heavily used small talk. No modification. That's not a pseudocode. That's a copy-paste, right? And now, if you read it, it's pretty much straightforward. You know, if the file is closed, there is no point closing it. Uh, then you just close the file descriptor, the handle, unregister from finalization, and nail out the handle. Pretty straightforward. But I think you all now start to see the problem in it, in this very method, right? That's a very small talkish method. But uh, yeah, let me show you anyway. <laughs> let me show you anyway. Uh, so we have, we have two threads, A and B, and they are both about to close the, the file at the same time, pretty much the same time, right? We have green threads. We have only one thread running at a time. Uh, so, OK, first thread goes here, and then ping a context switch, right? The second thread, uh, thread goes here, ping a context switch. Uh, the file is not closed, so we both we can you know both threads get to the same point. We close the handle, okay, and now you know what is going to happen, right? <laughs> we close the handle twice. Well, that not that's not nice. I mean, we should we shouldn't be doing this, but perhaps closing a file twice. Well, who cares? Right? Uh, let's try something. A little, little bit different. Uh, we have two threads. One goes here, the other goes here. Uh, now the A closes the thread, right? Uh, and now we have a new thread, a thread C. And you go to the thread C, right? And we open the handle, right? But you know, the operating system is allowed to reuse handles. And it does. It does. So now we closed a randomly opened file from some other thread, completely unrelated. Uh, good luck debugging that mess. <laughs> I mean, as unlikely as it, as it may look, I guarantee that as soon as you deploy, it will happen. It happened to me, so it must have to happen to you. <laughs> uh, life must be fair, right? So no matter whether we have only green threads and whether we run only one thread at a time, we are essentially playing the same game as Java. So we need to lock. We need to lock massively, the same way as Java do. It. I mean, there are people saying, like, well, this is not our problem. The application programmer should care about this because he knows the application. That's a bullet point, but I'm kind of not eating it because, in a way, in my opinion, it's like saying, OK, the application programmer knows better than the machine where to free the memory. And you know, we are past that point where we discuss these differences, right? We all agree that we need a kind of a GC. So for me. We should really pay attention about this. And uh, I mean, I picked this from random small talk, but I am pretty sure that I would find places like this in every small talk, maybe except gemstone, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, in all small talks, I know sufficiently well, I'm pretty sure I would find cases which might lead into the mess like this. Right? 
So we need to lock, and we need to lock fast. So how to do it in a context of small talk, right? The rest, really all small talk, no more Java, I promise. Uh, yeah, I was talking that, you know, we have to, we have to really lock a lot. And uh, just a little uh, detour, like you say. There is a great game on GitHub. And you should really play it. I really enjoyed it. Uh, it's about this, you know, the example I just shown you. That's the, that's what is the game about, to find out these scenarios. And I think every programmer that ever gets to work with a system which has a concurrency implemented through a shared mutable state and threads should play that game. Uh, anyway, the solution, I mean, I didn't invent it anything. I just looked what has been done 20 years ago. And I found this brilliant paper, I found it really brilliant, uh, for a bunch of guys working on a J9 VM. Uh, I think whoever done anything in VM would recognize the names. Uh, <clears throat> and they introduced this for the, for the Java. And I did for the Java part of the VM back then, and it worked. But it also worked for a small talk quite well. Uh, so I implemented the small talk clocks using the, this algorithm. Uh, and then I spent some time carefully designing benchmark that would yield these nice numbers, right? So this is a very synthetic benchmark. But what you see here is that uh, the first thing is a, is a small talk implementation of particular version that has this it, like implemented and already in. There is a previous version which uh, used a traditional small talk implementation. So there was a full monitor object which uh, had you know, the, the process already owning the monitor, the counter, and the semaphore. And the semaphore operations were all in a small talk. You know, that's a dead big method because it's manually optimized and uh, hand in line small talk code, so that's why it's long. Uh, but still, it turns out that using these this thin locks actually is quarter of the time uh, of the pure small talk implementation, which is quite a yield. Uh, the, the yellow one is a faro. Uh, I just wanted to introduce because, you know, to, to show the faro, because that's what most of you know. Uh, very few of them probably ever heard about small talk X. That's why I did it. But anyway, uh, the FAR is much better. But the thing is that FAR uses a primitive for, for semaphore signaling. So uh, this is essentially the difference between using a primitive and having a pure small talk code that does it. Uh, now, this is if. You have a one thread that locks, do the job, and unlocks, and there is no, no contention. So no one's com compete over the shared, the, the critical section. Uh, of course, the monitors can, can recurse, so the critical section may lead into entering the critical section again. I mean, this is, this is something that uh, happens. You have a recursive code. Uh, and the Thinlocks are designed to, to support that also efficiently. Even though the case that the lock is unlocked, you go into it, do the stuff, and unlock it, that's the far most common case. Uh, and then there is a benchmark uh, which uh, actually benchmark the contention, so there are two threads trying to compete over, over the critical section. Uh, still, the, the the thin lock approach helps a lot. I have no really deep analysis why it helps because it, it essentially should be uh, should be as as uh, bad as the pure small talk implementation, as we will see soon. But uh, I think it's because it's so much quicker than there is actually less contention. 
but this is really hard to simulate deterministically. Anyway, this is the far, far most common case which actually matters. This is not that much as we've seen before on the, on the Java numbers. So how the trick works, right? Just a, a brief description. The paper is very straightforward and easy to read. But it essentially said, okay, you need a, something that is called log word. And they, they have the log word slightly different, different sizes and things like that. But this is the modification I have, I have done for small talk. So the log word is uh, either 32-bit or 64-bit, depending on the architecture, but that's just irrelevant detail. Uh, it's just a word, a machine word. And it has three fields. And if the lock is unlocked, so there is no one in the critical section, then all the bits are zero except the last one. Uh, and uh, if you lock it, so if there is a thread that locks the lock, uh, and the thread is, for example, the one, two, three. Then the log word looks like this. So, so in the high bits, you have the ID of the thread, and you have a zero in the in the yellow field, which is essentially the number, the nesting level. You know, the number of the times the the thread that owns the lock re-enters it, plus the one at the end. Uh, and that's where there is a, you know, it, when it enters for the very first time, so it's locked once. Uh, if you go there again, then you increment this counter. And you leave the one here and the same number. And now, when there is a contention, when you detect the contention, uh, what I do is that instead of a lock word, I simply put a full object pointer here. So this is a reference to the fat lock, to the old implementation with the counter, uh, semaphore, and uh, the process that is on there. So, so the stuff that has a three slots and a few methods around it. And you see, this is why I have the zero and the one here, because then this can be a normal instance variable. So if we are using only thin locks, then it's a small integer. And if there is a contention, and the thin, lock, thin locks cannot handle contention. Uh, they have to defer into a fat lock, which is the full size object. Then it's a, it's a full size object pointer. So that's, that's the idea. And it's, it's, it's really simple. There is nothing so interesting. Uh, and now, I'm going to show you how, it's, how, how simple is it in a code. But uh, yeah, there is going to be a C code. So this is, the, this is the acquire method of the monitor. So you may call it lock, or acquire, or enter, whatever. I call it acquire. Uh, and for implementation reasons, I also have a timeout uh, so I can do more interesting operations on top of it. But Really, this is also, it's not a real copy-paste. I have to shorten it because I tend to use the long names like Hernan. <laughs> and so it wouldn't fit, or it would fit, but you could, wouldn't be able to read it. But essentially what it does is that this is a kind of STX special syntax, so you can inline C code. And not, you don't need to rely on primitives that are defined somewhere else. It just makes things easier to read. So you call a method. Oh, sorry, you call a C function and you say, okay, try to do, try to lock this lock uh, using the, the thin locks. So only using this lock word and, and playing with bits and checking these bits and things like that. If this happens, then just return. Easy. That's the most common case. There is this no context kind of pragma which is also a bit of a technical optimization because it doesn't set up a full small tall context or frame object. So it's very fast. It's essentially a, a C function call. And, you know, as fast as a C function call, really. 
if you cannot lock, uh, well, you have to inflate the lock. This means that it might be locked by some threats, some, by some threat, but some other threats are trying to get the lock. So you need to inflate, so you extract the, the information you have in bits encoded in the small integer and create this fat lock and populate the process slot, the count slot, and the semaphore slot. That's the inflation. Uh, and then I just call a super, which calls the old implementation that is pure small talk. If two threads are trying to do the same time, well, we will see how the sin lock will look like inside in a minute. Yeah. And sorry. Well, one. Yeah, and the inflation it's itself is uh, synchronized. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's also at that point it's already locked. Uh, in that way, it's already locked by one thread. Uh, but I mean, you you may have two other threads that might try to inflate the lock on the same. Uh, I can show you later the details of this one, but this, this check is here like for the quick check, not to call the inflate uh, if it's already inflated, right? Because the thing is that this one, uh, the compiler optimizes this one to the bit test, uh, and then I don't need to do the message send. That's an that's a optimization. I could call in self-inflate unconditionally. Uh, no, the, no. So that, that's what protects yeah. I, I, will sh I can show you later, but uh, we would need a lot more code and a lot more technical details. I wasn't sure how much time I would have for this and how interesting is this. I can show you later. Get back to me. So that's, that's how this, this looks. And now the beauty of it, as I see it, is in this STX thin lock method. Right? Uh, the C, but I hope you can read it. I tried my best. So you get the pointer to the lock word because if you lock, you need to be able to change it. So that's why you have a pointer. And then it's really as simple as that, right? If it was unlocked, then I lock it once. And the, the CAS here stands for atomic comparance WAP. This is something that is present in, if not that in all modern CPU architectures, then in the vast majority of them, right? Uh, I mean, in Smalltalk we might not have to use the atomic operations, but I wanted to make the code ready for native threading, so I use them, but it doesn't need to be. Uh, if you do native threads, you have to use the atomic operations. Uh, and the nice thing is that if you use the atomic operations and things and you compile it to an optimizing compiler, this actually boils down to a memory fetch and atomic comparance swap in a, in a good case, I mean in the fast path, pretty fast. Uh, now, how comes that we can do the lock once so fast? I mean, you have to encode the, the point, the, 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 the thread ID into the small integer, put the, put the one there and things like that. So you need to do some shifts and or and things. And I said, it's just a memory fetch. Well, the thing is, the, the, the clever thing here is that it's, it's said here, right? Uh, the unlocked is just a constant. And the thing is that the thread IDs used by the VM are already pre-shifted with the one at the end. So it's really a memory fetch. Now, another trick is 
that if you structure your threat information block in a clever way, so you have this, you have this threat ID uh, together with all other informations which you use very often, then highly likely this would be already in a cache line, in a CPU cache. So really, the fetch is also fast, quite fast. Uh, well, then lock twice is just you add a two because you have to keep the one at the end. But uh, you only add the two, like do, you do the add operation if it, if it was locked once and you go there once again, which is a lot less common. That's the measurement. That's the statistic over the code. Uh, so again, that you just lock, if it's locked once, then I just lock it twice. Uh, and then, if not even that holds, then I just have to you know extract the process ID, check whether whether the nesting level is really less than the maximum because I, we have a finite finite amount of bits to encode the count. Uh, and then we do just the compare swap again. And if this doesn't work, so you know, it was, there wasn't what was expected, I just say, OK, I cannot do anything, just defer everything to the thin lock, I inflate, and do the fat, slow implementation. Really, that's it. Let me, see, let, me, let me say a few more comments on it. Uh, the interesting part is that uh, it's not so complicated. The code is essentially simpler than what, is you, what it was before. Uh, when I refactor the code to use thin locks, no matter how much of new code I have to written you know, to this inline function and things like that, and I put a lot of comments into it, I still, if I looked at the, at the comments, I managed to remove for good thousand line of code. Having the, having the, having the system four times faster and ready for native threats. Isn't that great? <laughs> right? So by deleting a code, I make it four times faster. Well, that's a bit of an exaggeration because the, the benchmark was very, very synthetic. But uh, yeah, I found it interesting. If you delete all the code, it will be even faster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you can see it that way. The question is, is going to run? <laughs> <laughs> no so, errors. questions? None? Perfect. Okay. So you can implement that on any model, right? You have to use like a well, but maybe you can try because you use uh, some of the JavaScript feature from the Well, yeah, yeah. Well, there are, there is more to it to make it make it that fast as I did. Uh, I didn't speak about it because uh, you see, I, I for example mark this method as an inline, which means that this code gets in line into the, into the small talk method. And then because we have a full optimizing C compiler behind, then it can restructure the code in a way that uh, it fits the CPU. So there are, there are things like that. And, and uh, for example, there is a critical method, you know, a, a log critical, which does the, you know, acquire do the stuff, release, but the acquire, sorry, the do the stuff has to be inside the ensure block with the release at the end, and the blocks makes problems because, you know, creating blocks is slow, so slow, so I have to eliminate these blocks. So there is a lot more I did to optimize that, but essentially, this is the core of the, of the thing. Okay, you have to finish. Yeah.